in as much as nobody had access to the book before tonight, or mostly you didn't. Am I amplified? Can you hear me? Um, I didn't assign any reading, and I learned from the time we did the Bhagavad Gita, I guess it was, that I don't like to commit myself to a certain minimum number of pages. So my intention in this course, and many of you have been through these with me before, is that over the next three or four months, however long we're scheduled, we'll just start at the beginning and get as far as we get. Um, I've, I think it's more important to thoroughly discuss each section than it is to sort of whip through the book. Um, if we finish the book in these months, that'll be great. And if not, when we start the next cycle of classes, because it's the time is arbitrarily defined by the publishing of our calendar. Otherwise, it's just every Tuesday follows the Tuesday before it, and there's no actual real breaks in our lives. <laughs> so I'm going to start at the beginning, and um, I'll, I'll refer to what I'm referring to in the book, since many of you will not have had a chance to read it yet. And then probably we'll just do the first um, sutra today, plus the introduction. Okay? I think almost all of you have been in these classes before, but I talk for a while and I give you a chance to ask questions and we can run it as informally as we like because we make a video and an audio recording. <coughs> if you do ask questions, we need you to speak into the mic, demonstrate for them how to use the mic, close to your mouth, pay attention to the fact that you're hearing it um, amplified. It's really <laughs> it's very good. Just a second. It's really for the sake of the recording, though, because if you're not on the microphone, then the people who watch um, will just hear this big empty spot, and it's just very, it's very inconvenient. And the audience for these classes is bigger than the people in the room. I learned also when I was out of the country that it, they go everywhere. All right. So, the... First, I'll speak for just a few minutes about this book, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. Many years ago, when Yogananda was still living, he gave a series of classes on uh, the Yoga Sutras. Uh, somebody um, took notes of those classes, and an unedited set of those notes had sort of been an underground document within Ananda for many years. Um, the classes were given, what, in the 40s or in the 30s, sometime before Swami Kriyananda came to Master is when the classes were held. The notes, as I said, we don't know exactly who took them. We don't know how accurately they took them, and they're just whoever wrote them down. So even though people have had an interest in those notes, Swamiji has never felt comfortable allowing them to be widely distributed because many of the things that are stated in there are written down as if they were master's own words are either unclear, contradictory, or, or misleading in one way or another, and he just didn't feel it was appropriate um, to allow master to be represented. He allowed them to be circulated among people who had enough experience to not be, uh, to, to a, uh, ask the question about whether this was really what master would have said or did say. Um, but because there has always been this interest in the Yoga Sutras, and as Gyandev, who wrote the um, preface to this book, uh, the for forward, I think is the right word, he wrote the forward, Gyandev is the head of Ananda Yoga, Ananda Hatha Yoga, and also a founding member of the Yoga Alliance, and a really big figure in the Yoga Postures movement, both in Ananda and in America and actually globally, because that alliance is global now. Um, and because, in, oddly enough, a lot of the popularity of Patanjali has come out of the Yoga Postures movement, because it's considered to be the only scripture about yoga. Of course, yoga means union, and it really means the union of the, you know, the individual soul with the divine soul, but the word yoga also means yoga postures, obviously. And as Gyandev writes in there, Patanjali refers to asana, um, meaning how you sit when you meditate. But, and as Gyandev puts it, yoga posture 
practitioners have taken that to mean that Patanjali recommended yoga postures. Although, as Gyandev says, there is no evidence that he did. The mere presence of the word asana in the context in which he used it. But nonetheless, because also because, I believe, because Patanjali's yoga sutras are considered to be authoritative scripture, but are not associated with any religion and have no context of God or church or priest or anything like that, it's sort of like been a very suitable thing for yoga postures adherents and uh, ex what you might call new age thinkers or, or people who are sort of moving into a new consciousness but are not uh, inclined to be devotees or don't necessarily want to think in terms of God and guru. And so it's served a purpose in that sense, but it hasn't always been understood. It's just been, pop people have been popularly interested in it. Um, Swami Kriyananda for many years has talked about maybe he should do something with the Patanjali notes as they're referred to. But every time he's looked at them at all, there's actually been questions of legality associated because we don't really know who, to whom they belong. So does he really want to edit them? And I, I think he's just considered it too much of a... Uh, it's not, it wasn't clear-cut enough for him to work with or clearly enough masters to work with. Master never, he never worked with master on those classes. But it's always sort of been out there, this annoyance, and many people over the course of the years have wanted Swamiji to do something with the Patanjali notes. Because since Patanjali is considered to be such an authority on yoga, since we present ourselves not only with yoga postures, but with, of course, all aspects of yoga, it seemed like a big hole in the system. And Swamiji, in these last years of his life, almost much to his own surprise, just keeps finding himself inspired and inclined to pick up projects that he thought he would never pick up. But it was very interesting when I was reflecting on this. Um, the Bible, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, the, the Gita, of course, and now Patanjali. These are all, you know, scriptures by, well, I haven't heard that Omar Khayyam was a, an avatar, but the other three are considered to be avatars. Omar Khayyam was obviously a very advanced soul, whatever his state of consciousness is. But these seem to be specific teachings that not only have existed through Kali Yuga, but apparently have a destiny to go forward. Um, I say this um, apparently in the sense that Master's teachings have been brought, and Master as an avatar has come, at this particular time to transition us from, Dwapara, from Kali Yuga into Dwapara. And this is a very important transition on the planet where we're setting a completely new understanding of what the spiritual path is about, which is what's going to define this planet for centuries, centuries, and centuries to come. And Swamiji has said that Master is the avatar for Dwapara Yuga in that his message was about energy, his message is about the underlying unity. And so this particular scripture having played an important role all this time, but as Swamiji writes in, the, in his own preface here, he said he worked with five different translations of this, each one of which was as bad as the one before was basically how he put it. And he says it in such a humorous way. He said, I don't speak Sanskrit, but I can tell when the English is bad. <laughs> And he just could tell that this couldn't, the way they were translated and then interpreted from those translations, as he put it, could not possibly have been Patanjali's intention. Because even though Swami says he never, um, he wasn't part of Master's classes on this, he says specifically that he and Master talked about Patanjali's teachings a great deal. He said during the times that he had with Master when they were out on the desert, they didn't work on a commentary the way he worked with him on the Gita commentary or the way Master gave him both the Rubaiyat and the Bible to work with because Master didn't write a commentary on this scripture. But Swamiji says that he was taught Patanjali directly by Master. So when, he came, when it came time for him to write this book, he essentially worked backwards from what he knew it had to mean, knew it had to mean from the interpretation that had been given to him 
and then tried to discern from these confusing translations. Now that's how he writes it um, when he's describing, introducing the book. His own private comment about this is just a statement about the state of consciousness and the life, the state of life he finds himself in at this point, where he, he, he just says that things just come to him now without, seemingly without effort, where he, just, he doesn't have to try to think about what it's supposed to mean. He just knows and he can write extremely quickly. I, the, the number of days it took him to write this book escapes me at the moment, but it was a, um, an, an, an extraordinarily short period of time. And when he recently wrote another book, the book Love Perfected, Life Divine, he wrote it in eight days. And he said even for him, he thought that was pretty fast. <laughs> but the, the reason he explains is that he, he doesn't have to, to, to contemplate what needs to be said. He just finds that there it is. He's just, he's just ready to say it. So there is a certain amount of, he, he justifies his interpretations by talking about his training with Master when he introduces this book. When he speaks more privately, he speaks also about the fact that he just feels like Master just told him what it was supposed to be. And there was just no question about it in his own mind. He just, even when he said when sometimes he would just be very confused, and then suddenly he would just know. And then he would write it out in that way. And as Swamiji also describes in here, he says, you know, what, what most of the other translations and commentaries lack was clarity. And that's not a surprise, really, because no other avatar commented on, you know, they didn't comment on Patanjali. No, no one else is working from the revelations of an avatar about the work of another avatar. And even though Swami's an intermediary between Master and Patanjali, nonetheless, um, he's still working with the direct revelations of one who had the same state of consciousness. Truthfully, when you read through this and you realize how exceedingly cryptic Patanjali was, you realize that the, the only possible way that you can draw this enormous implication from that is that somehow you have to glimpse the reality that Patanjali was, was glimpsing. And Swamiji says in his humorous way, he says, I like clarity. And he said, I believe what I have written here is true, but whatever it is, at least it's clear. <laughs> and if you decide that you don't think it's, or you dispute it from one point or another, he said, at least I've clearly stated what it is that I perceive to be the reality here. I find this interesting. Does, I don't know if it's written on the back. Yes, right. This is... This book is, the, is a confluence of three consciousnesses. The original Patanjali, Master's instruction of Swamiji, and then Swamiji's expression of what Master gave him. And so it's, it's, a, uh, it's a fascinating sort of study because you're, you're getting all of them at the same time. I can't really say that I could parse it apart and say who was influencing what. But certainly... And I, I have to admit, I personally have spent very little time on Patanjali because there were enough clearly written things that I hadn't really studied in my life that I just didn't need to try to study something that I couldn't understand. I, other people had need, felt the need to do it or the draw to do it. It's all a karmic question. Um, but I never thought Patanjali was so um, sweet. And I think that it must be the truth of his consciousness because all masters have that um, extreme compassionate concern for us. But you always think of Patanjali as sort of austere and in a sense it really is. When I, uh, some of you have read, wrote, read the letters that I wrote from India, but after I read this, it, it really um, shifted my concept of the spiritual path. It had such a, a strong effect on me that I, I just saw the spiritual path from a slightly different angle than I'd ever seen it before. One far more impersonal than I have been inclined to think about and also just so simple. You know, your consciousness is a matter of the level of reality with which you identify. And the entire spiritual path 
is to gradually identify with the infinite and to stop identifying with the limited. It helped me that I read this virtually by myself, staying in the spare bedroom of an Indian woman I had just met in the city of Bangalore, virtually undisturbed for three days because there was nothing for me to do and nobody seemed to want me to do anything. So I was in an ideal situation because there was nothing reminding me of who I normally was and, and a great deal allowing me just to, to reinvent myself in the moment. So I really felt it was a, a really a God-given opportunity because by the time I finished it, I, I began to understand and, and for the rest of the months, uh, eight weeks that I was there, you know, up to and including the present, I began to have a new solution um, to what ails us. And I, I, like, um, I like cohesive, uh, generic solutions that can be applied to all situations. Whatever causes us pain, I like to have a one band-aid, you know, the all-purpose pill. And identifying with, with a level of reality that is limited and therefore makes you capable of, of experiencing pain and then shifting your sense of identity to a higher level um, has become for me one of those extremely nifty all-purpose solutions. So we're just going to start in this discussion, but that's going to be the recurring theme because that's, from, for me, at the end of this book, that's where I ended up. But you see, that thought had never been accessible to me before, I think is the word I want to use. Uh, even though that thought had been spoken to me many times, there was never a, a vibratory capacity within me to connect with that idea. And what I found from reading this book, being in touch with the consciousness of these three great souls, was somehow it, there was at least a pathway, a visible pathway, from how, of how to get from here to there, which is as much in the vibration as in the words. So it's not just a question of, oh, here's an idea I never thought of before, because ideas are just ideas. It's when actual magnetism is transferred, and so that when you hear that idea, all of a sudden you, you're looking through that window. And I feel that's really what Swamiji has done for us here. Not only has he explained the scripture, and it's, I don't think it's ever been really explained, at least people who have been trying to understand it for years confirm that, um, but also he's created a magnetism. And that magnetism, you see, and this is what I was saying, there's a, Swamiji is so compassionate when he writes, and Master is so compassionate when he writes, that even when we're being told very um, uncompromisingly elevated teachings, the vibration that, that Swamiji has Im- infused this book with, which I'm sure is the vibration of the author, of Patanjali also, of course it's Master's vibration, is, the, is that you can do it. <laughs> this isn't really beyond you. This is really what you're looking for, uh, which is the only really way we can go at spiritual life. Otherwise, nothing else works. You know, if, we, if we don't enjoy it, we won't do it. Okay, any questions or thoughts about any of that before I go forward from there? Okay. That's right. Thank you. Are you saying that it's only recently that you felt you had yourself reached a, a particular level of consciousness to be able to relate to that concept? No. It's not that I've advanced. It's that Swami simplified it for me and made it clear. <laughs> <laughs> And then planted grace in the book. Yeah. So whereas I just never went there before because I it didn't have any any power beyond the theoretical for me. Yeah. Suddenly it's like, oh, guess what? You know, all we have to do is just not identify with the wrong reality. Isn't that great? You know, it, it sounds like a uh, duh, but still, it's different when you know it. You can say God is love, you can say it over and over again, and then one day you know it. 
and it's completely different than words. So, than just words. Okay. So, let me pull it. <clears throat> it's interesting, Swami, um, the first thing Swami has in this book is a one-page preface, which he calls The Anathema of Blind Belief. And it was partly reading this preface that made me start thinking about what the role of Patanjali is in Master's teachings, you know, and, and how interesting it is that Master, Master's mission was, was, as it turns out, to, to pull from various other traditions and then re-express them in terms of self-realization. It, it's, it's an interesting point in this respect also because when Jesus came, when Jesus came, um, he was a rabbi in the Jewish tradition. He was an avatar to the Jewish people. He, he was there to fulfill the scripture, not to contradict it. Um, he never stopped being a Jew. The only, most of the people who were interested in him were the other Jews. And so there was no break in the continuous spiritual lineage. The break came much later. The break came when the, the Jewish people were not interested in Jesus' teachings, which came forth after he had passed away when his disciples were going around to the various synagogues trying to tell them about this further iteration of Judaism. And only when the power structure of Judaism, which is really what it was, rejected that, and there was no audience in the synagogues anymore, that Paul went out to the, what's called the Gentiles. Gentiles, of course, is your point of view. <laughs> you know, we're heathen to some. <laughs> Depends on which side you're on. But he went to the non-Jewish communities because the, the Jews were not interested. And then Jesus became not a Jew anymore because this whole other thing started. But it wasn't started by the avatar. It just came about as society plays its story out and revelation becomes religion. And so what Swamiji is talking about here is two things. He's talking about the fact that um, dogmas are not the same as truth. And that, you know, revelation is an actual experience, which it later becomes, as he puts it here, um, how did he say it? Religion everywhere offers us attainment of the highest that is in us and then boxes us in with sectarianism, intolerance, and threats of divine punishment to anyone who fails to toe the line. It's meaning that they, we offer the, it offers us the ability to transcend all these limitations, and then religion itself starts imposing more and more on us. So what Swamiji is also saying about Patanjali is that, he said people speak of Patanjali as a system, but he's not a system. He's a description of spiritual progress. He simply describes the stages of spiritual experience that everyone will go through. He's absolutely the opposite of sectarianism. And Swamiji emphasizes how Master said, self-realization has come to unite all religions, and that the unifying reality between the seemingly different religions are the principles of self-realization, the principles and the, act, the actuality of self-realization, and what Patanjali's scripture is, is a description of the stages of self-realization. He doesn't actually teach you how to attain them. He says, you know, this brings this, this brings this, this brings this. There's no, there's no method. There's no kriya. Um, you know, there's no discipleship. There's nothing. He just says, as your consciousness expands, this is what you will perceive and this is what you will experience. In other words, it's the absolute solid foundation for what Master brought and what Master promised, which is that self-realization is the unifying reality. And Swamiji you know, begins this book by saying that, um, he says, Patanjali brings to mankind more than a fresh breath of truth. He brings the wind of a new reality. And so he's also, Swamiji is holding this book up, or this commentary, essentially the scripture up, is the way for our society to escape from this chaos of sectarianism. 
And of course, this is not going to persuade um, the Kali Yuga bound mentality, but it is going to be the pathway for those who have the ears to hear. And will then eventually, you know, you, just, you can sort of see, we won't live to see these things, most of us, but, but I believe over the course of time and in our next incarnations, you'll sort of see how these threads are really going to play through. And so it's also helpful for us when we're studying this to really see what Swamiji is trying to accomplish here. You know, the, the anathema of blind belief. He really wants us to put our understanding of spirituality on the basis of actual experience. And of course, we can't ourselves know all of these. And in fact, later on in here, one of my favorite um, uh, slok uh, slokas, sutras, is Patanjali says that there's three ways to know things. One is direct experience, one is inference from that experience, and the third is valid spiritual authority. So he does, he does speak of that, and that also has become a very interesting thing for me. If, you're, uh, if you infer incorrectly, even from valid experience, <laughs> you're not, still not going to have truth, and that's why valid authority is often a, an important part of it. But then Patanjali is laying down principles, you see. He's not declaring what, what that, that authority is or who is the authority. He just merely says that valid spiritual authority is one of the ways that we know things. So all of these then become ways of elevating the discussion. And since you know, many of us have or will have responsibility not only for our own understanding of these, but for explaining it to people around us, we always do. This book is also really, really useful because Patanjali is sort of an undisputed non-sectarian source. And insofar as we're talking to people who respect that, having a real understanding of what he said is going to be very helpful to all of us. Okay. So. Okay. Swamiji is just so frank. He's always been frank, but he, he minces words even less than he used to. <laughs> which is where, this is where he said, of all the translations of Patanjali to which I've been exposed, not one has been worth the trouble of an in-depth, serious study. He says that very emphatically. Okay? M many or most of the sutras are too muddled in translation even to make sense. Well, he has the right to say it, so I'll just leave it. I like clarity. So, he said, I was more able, moreover, to ask my guru personally about many of the subjects covered by Patanjali, and his explanations have lingered with me, as he puts it, which is putting it mildly. He does say, when he wrote the Gita commentary, he could hear Master's explanations in his mind. He doesn't claim such a thing with Patanjali because there was no systematic study of it. But, of course, he has the right. All right. So, any comments or questions before we go to actually sutra number one, which is so famous? Yes. That comment that this is an independent... Um, verification of our own gurus, what he's been teaching us mm -hmm. over the years is, is <coughs> I find that very helpful because then we can, we don't have to just say, you have to believe what my guru said. Mm -hmm. You can say, well, look, you know, it's, it was written 2,000 years ago in another source that has nothing to do with our tradition. That's true. And you have the Bible, the comments on the Bible, you have the comment on the Gita, you have the comment on the Rubaiyat, you have the comment on the Patanjali. So it does really broaden Master's authority and make him part of a flow of energy. Of course, he's interpreting all of them also, but still, it, it's, not a, it's not a new, new revelation, it's a new expression. And it's, very, it's an extremely important point. And a, a drawing forward what should be drawn forward and a leaving behind what needs to be left behind. I was having a conversation with a, a friend about Catholicism today with our new Pope Francis whom at least his name we all like to say. <laughs> and uh, the, you know, there was some question, well, it seems like God would send something for all the Catholics, you know, trying to put the most hopeful spin on Pope Francis. And I said, why? Because all his name's not going to make it into Dwapara Yuga. <laughs> it's a completely Kali Yuga institution. And then I pointed out, there's no such thing as Catholics. 
there's just people who at the present time are living in circumstances in which they have chosen to embrace Catholicism. The soul doesn't have a religion. The soul is just part of the infinite. And uh, there's, there, this is a changing time. I'm not, you know, I don't mind if people want to be Catholics, and I hope Pope Francis turns out to be a great guy for the church, but we have to understand that this is a time when things are shifting. We're, we're going someplace else, and I think the more courageously we embrace that, the better we are. But we have to cr embrace it with intelligent understanding and not just <clears throat> whatever. Lack of clarity, how's that? Yeah, good enough. So, sutra number one of book, of book number one, Samadhi Padha, this is explained. And you've all heard this now. The subject now being offered is yoga. And now Swamiji spends us several pages on this, and I will too, because it's really worth talking about. <clears throat> Swami says, there are two important keys to understanding this first aphorism. One is that these teachings offer no mere debate on the subject. Patanjali is giving us his own realized wisdom. This is, of course, a distinction that we have to emphasize less in the context here, where we have, the, we have an understanding of what an avatar or self-realized master is. But this is very distinct from the way intellectual people will comment about scripture, and they'll have conversations, and they'll share opinions, and they'll decide who's best. There was even a process, as I recall, not too long ago, where a, a, some consortium of New Testament scholars voted and, and they voted together as to what it actually meant or not. Um, in Revelations of Christ, Swamiji deals with tremendous um, intensity and clarity about who has the right to say, you know, what a scripture means. And the ones who have the right to say are the ones who have the state of consciousness that that scripture is, deci is describing. And in fact, interestingly on that, sutra that eventually will come to, that's, that Swami translated as valid spiritual authority is often translated as the scriptures. And Swamiji said it couldn't possibly be the scriptures. Master himself spoke many times. Scriptures are just words on a page. They have to be interpreted by someone of consciousness. And the scriptures alone do not make valid authority because everybody disagrees about what the scriptures mean. So we have to go to a source who has that consciousness. And whether or not we trust that source is why now we come to the subject of yoga. Because what Swami goes on to say, the second key lies in the insignificant seeming word now. And he said, which suggests that there have been prior dissertations. So the way this is always understood and the way Master explained this is that they, they speak of three basic um, philosophies, as Swamiji says, is what we call them in English because we don't have the right word for them. But there's three parts of the spiritual path. And the first part is Shankya. And Shankya is the why of the spiritual path. Now, we all know that not everyone is interested. We think that the spiritual path, to those of us who are interested in it, is so compelling and irresistibly important that we all have gone through the long process of trying to persuade people who are not interested that they ought to be interested. Um, classically, and you've heard me say it, but it applies so perfectly to this situation, when I, in my teens, my late teens, when I started in this, tried to convert a, a, an acquaintance relative of mine, a distant one, that they ought to be on the spiritual path. And I talked about the Shankya philosophy, what I might have called it even by that name, which the Shankya philosophy says the reason that we should seek the spiritual path is because nothing else is fulfilling. And, that, and I'll explain that more in a few moments because that's the whole thing we're talking about. And I said to my friend, haven't you noticed that you desire something deeply, you work hard to get it, and then when you get it, it doesn't fulfill you in the way that you'd hoped. She was saying, yes, yes, I've certainly experienced it. But before I could give her my conclusion, her conclusion is, that's why it's so important to keep wanting new things. And, you know, I was just stunned because it was a, an interpretation of that experience that I would never have put on it. 
you know, for, to me, the fact that the, the, the expectation of fulfillment was always greater than the actual fulfillment of the realities that were offered to me that were supposed to actually satisfy me, that seemed to demand a different response instead of just, let's just keep running faster. But in her mind, having experienced the disappointment of this, then it's very important that we buy that. And then as soon as that disappoints us, then we just need to keep moving. Just keep moving. And she was an exceedingly outward person. She had seemingly good-hearted, kind, but seemingly very little awareness of her own inner reality. So what we describe, I started to say, Shankya is the why of it. Vedanta is the what. Vedanta is the description of the universe. What is, you know, how everything in the universe is really Satchit Ananda. We don't really deal with either of those. And then yoga is the, is the method, is how you do it. And even though, as Swami says, Patanjali is not exactly a system, nonetheless, he describes the process by which you cease to identify with this, why you concentrate on that. But when I say it's not a method, it's like, it's one thing to say, you know, don't identify anymore with the transitory world. It's quite another to, to know how to master your energy to be able to actually do that. Kriya Yoga, discipleship, energization, Hong Sa, Om technique, those are all the methods by which we master our consciousness so that we can enter into these states that Patanjali describes. But Patanjali is telling us that there's this step-by-step -step expansion of consciousness, and that's what it is we're looking for. But no one is going to be interested in that until they have sufficiently understood, especially Shankya. And he says, why should we, why should everyone embrace the spiritual path? This is essentially the subject of Shankya. The answer is partly that we, as earthly beings, are divided in two. We are drawn upward toward soul happiness, but at the same time downward to our past worldly habits. There is also a universal two-fold impulse that guides us all. We want to escape pain, and we want to find happiness. He says, these basic needs manifest themselves on different levels of refinement, octaves, he said we might call them. The highest octave is the desire to escape pain. The, on, at the highest octave, the desire to escape pain as seen, is seen as the true devotee's intense desire to shake off the delusion of separateness from God and to unite his soul with him. So that fundamental impulse to escape pain, when we really understand it at the highest level, we realize the only way to actually never to suffer is to unify our consciousness with the divine. In other words, to, to identify, to become one with the only reality that there is. On a lower octave, those twin desires are experienced as a longing for worldly fulfillment and to wish to avoid the disappointment that accompanies such fulfillment. Okay, so now we come to this question of worldly fulfillment. And sometimes people get a little tense when we start talking about these things, so don't get tense. Let's just, let's just deal with these, like, casually and easily. He says, I mean, because I mean, it sounds judgmental or it sounds limiting, but that's what we're talking about here. We do not want the practice of yoga until we understand why we want it. And to imagine that any of us actually understand it clearly enough is to be extremely naive. Because Shankya philosophy describes the power of maya to continually persuade us that the way to escape pain is not merely to unite ourselves with God, but to have on a lower octave a longing for worldly fulfillment, that's the desire for happiness, and a wish to avoid the disappointment that accompanies such fulfillment. What do I mean by worldly fulfillment, he says? I mean three things, basically. Ambition for money, the desire to escape pain through drugs or alcohol, and the drive for sexual satisfaction. 
These are the three main delusions under which humanity labors as if under a yoke. True fulfillment can never be found in any of them. Subsidiary to these basic delusions, but disappointing nonetheless, are the desire for power, for fame, for popularity, for emotional excitement and emotional fulfillment, and for all kinds of ego satisfaction. So, here we all are. I mean, we're all in this together, so nobody has to be either embarrassed or try to be somebody that we're not. It doesn't serve the cause to, um, to not happily and humbly acknowledge the reality of our own consciousness. This is a very subtle point that people have a difficulty. A lot of times people have a difficulty understanding this. That merely to be able to see you know, one's own vibration is not to condemn yourself to always be on that vibration. Um, to merely be able to just know that these are the things that I'm dealing with. You don't have to always try to pretend to be something that you're not. I mean, pretending that you're something that you're not is not the same as what Patanjali is really talking about, where we really shift our identification to a higher level of reality. I'm not sure I'm saying that clearly enough. You know, when Swamiji tells us how fundamental these thoughts are, and here's, here's, let me go on, because he says, there is a philosophical explanation for um, the disappointments that come. And this is how he describes it. He said, our consciousness, the, the normal consciousness we live in is like waves on the top of an ocean. But even though we're only aware most of the time of the waves on the top of the ocean, underneath that restless surface, there is the enormous depth of the entire ocean. And as Swami describes it so perfectly here, he said no matter how much those waves go up and down, they never actually affect the level of the ocean overall. Every wave that goes up, correspondingly, there's a trough. And all of these desires for egoic satisfaction, however we're defining it, is the movement of the waves on the surface of the sea of our consciousness. And we want those, those surface waves to hold a certain form because we've decided that's where our happiness is going to come from, but it's an impossibility. And they will never fully express the reality of the sea itself. And so inevitably, no matter how dynamically we can embrace it or make it happen, something always has to come to balance it. And Insofar as we're living on the surface of the sea, when that wave shifts and the balancing reality comes, the love of our life becomes ill and we no longer have that relationship. We ourselves change and that which was so comforting and wonderful to us at a certain point is simply no longer comforting and wonderful. Those wonderful children that we so adored raising grow up and move far away from us. Um, the desire we had for a certain something doesn't come to us, or it comes to us for a time, and we've all lived through it. Now, Swami um, says something really fascinating here, which I was really interested. He said, he, he just states, creation is ruled by duality. For every up there is a down. For every plus a minus. Every pleasure is balanced by an equal displeasure. Every joy by a sorrow. I've said those things lots of times, and I've had so many people say, no. No, no, life is beautiful, life is beautiful, they'll say. I say, okay. <laughs> but he says here, I mean, because, you know, sometimes he just puts it really well. I love this one. Only a little reflection should suffice to convince you of this truth. Here's the part. Unfortunately, he said, the mind is restless and lights only briefly like a fly on any given object of contemplation. If you would gain the benefits of contemplation, which is to say yoga, and of spiritual realization, Vedanta, the first necessity is stillness of mind. Okay, are you following that? And that stillness is the fruit of yoga practice. 
And without yoga, there can be no true understanding of Shankya. So, when we can't perceive the ever-changing nature of this world because we can't still our minds long enough to get a, a big perception of it, then we simply don't know it. We don't know. And we become convinced, absolutely convinced, that this is a beautiful world and everything's going to work out fine. We've forgotten our past lives. We're not paying attention to the experiences of everyone around us. We're drawing certain inferences from our own experience, but we're not drawing true inferences from our own experience, and we're rejecting valid authority. So when the masters tell us repeatedly that these are the truths, and we posit against it our own experience, all that we're saying is that we don't fully understand Shankya yet, and even though we may be trying to practice yoga, we're still going to be not quite immersed in it. Because a piece of us still thinks, let's see, on a lower octave, those twin desires are experienced as a longing for worldly fulfillment and a wish to avoid the disappointment that accompanies that fulfillment. I mean, Swamiji used to, I used to, I used to br uh, bristle a little at the emphatic way Swamiji would state things. And you know, there he's stating it and the disappointment that follows that fulfillment. And that's why, you know, now we come to the practice of yoga, because prior to that, we're not really going to be able to practice with our whole hearts. Or, if we find ourselves divided in our practice of yoga, it's really easy to see, because a piece of us is still thinking, but you know, this time it's going to work out. It didn't really work out the last so many millions, but this time it's going to, for this reason and that reason, and this, you know, this is a, my true love, and this, you know, this time it's really going to work, and this time we're going to have the children, and the government's not going to confiscate, and, you know, whatever it might be. I mean, there's so many forces that interrupt the smooth reality of our life. My, my father's life, it was interesting. He was a, um, a very, very intelligent man. And at the age in which he was being educated, what they did with bright children was they just skipped grades. So he was like in college uh, by the time he was 16 or so. And uh, he had his master's when he was really young. But uh, did he get a master's? Where am I in that? I'm not exactly... Yeah, I think he had a master's but not a PhD. But then he got drafted in the First World War. And he, he, he really was... He was made by God to be a college professor. But he, was, he got, had a very low draft number, and he got drafted into, into the army right at, right at that point, and he had to serve five years. By the time he got out of the army, um, there was my mother and my brother, and I think me, <laughs> or maybe I wasn't quite there, but my mother and my brother were there, and uh, she was never willing to let him go back and do what he needed to do to become a college professor, so he found his way, but he, he was always was never quite where he had, had been setting out to go. Because of being put into the army, he met my mother. He never would have been in the city where she was if it hadn't been for the army. You know, he loved her dearly for 56 years. What can I say? Everything is a piece of something. But yet sometimes, you know, I just feel it in my heart. When I was old enough to realize he, he sold insurance for many years, which was like so far outside of his actual reality, finally became an actuary. He found out something to do, but you know, it would still hurt my heart. It's just like there's so many poignant elements in everybody's life. And how, how can any one individual decide whether or not there's going to be a war and a draft? You know, right now I heard this morning that the EU will bail out Cyprus if, if Cyprus confiscates 10% of everybody's money. It's just like everybody's going to be sitting there and all of a sudden they'll have 10% less money because that's just what's going to happen. How, how do we have any control over these things? These are all just for every upward moving wave, there's a downward moving wave. And for some of us, these facts seem enormously self-evident and absolutely relevant. Um, and to others, they don't. 
because it just depends on how much of Shankya you have really absorbed into yourself. Why, why do I need to practice yoga? That's what Shankya is. So I'll say it one more time and then we'll take a break here. No, there's just that thought. We have, to, uh, we have to look all around and see where are the holes in my bucket. Sometimes we think the hole in my bucket is, well, I just need to get up earlier every morning and have a longer meditation. But we also need to ask ourselves the question, why don't I? You know, what, what, am I what are my really core beliefs that are being demonstrated by my actions? And do I, are those really my beliefs? And how do I want to really work with that? And that's why this first sutra just puts it up there. You have to understand why you're practicing yoga or else it's not going to do anything for you. Okay, let's take a break. And then if we have questions, we'll start there. We'll just, the, I was asked the question, someone was saying that, that she had just been com- commenting with her husband today that, uh, you know, this is a very nice period. Everything's going really well. <laughs> and there was sort of that slight thought, well, if I'm getting my happiness from the things around me, I said, no, that's not the same. To, to just say that things are going beautifully, it would be rude to, to say otherwise. It's when at the same time, but you know, this is what Swamiji says here, even in the midst of fulfillment, there's a part of us that always knows that this is not going to last. And if we just simply know that this is a lovely period and then maybe that we're going to have more external difficulties tomorrow and maybe this whole incarnation is just going to go beautifully, that's entirely different than always living in the expectation that this is going to actually finally bring me that final fulfillment. And when our equanimity is more or less, um, is not determined by external conditions, when our sense, our inner sense of peace or security or um, God loving us or however we define our, whatever aspect of Satchitananda we are ourselves attached to, when it is no longer susceptible to the ever-changing waves on the surface of the ocean, that's when we're becoming much more deeply anchored in these teachings. But we have to respond, and we have to observe. This is, as Sri Yukteswar says, we don't become stupid by becoming spiritual. And it would be just like a lack of intelligence not to say, look, isn't it just beautiful? Our family's doing so well, and everyone's so healthy. Isn't this marvelous? And, but, but to say, therefore, I'm happy and I'll be happy forever because everything's going so well, that's when you step onto the side of uh, false understanding. But to, to merely see what's happening. When we were in the middle of the um, litigation that Ananda went through for that dozen years, and, and we were in the middle of the, some of the really intense period of that, I remember saying to, to David, I sure am glad I've had other experiences of the spiritual path because if this was the only thing I ever experienced, you know, this would be a a hard pill to swallow. But I know that there have been periods before this and there will be periods after it. And that's a great deal of what makes it easy to go through. And it doesn't, this is what people misunderstand, it doesn't make the pleasant times less pleasurable. In fact, it makes them more so because there's always that if, if your happiness is dependent on this situation staying the way it is, there's always that deeper than conscious realization that there's not a chance in the world that it will stay this way. And therefore, there's always that tension. That's what attachment is. Attachment is that tension that requires, requires us to grip because we know that this is a wave, and we, meaning we know on some level that it's a wave, so we desperately hold on to it because inevitably we know it's going to be ripped out of our hands. But when we know it's a wave and we just ride the wave, we don't have to grip it so hard because it's just a wave. And if it takes us to a beautiful shore, then let's admire the flowers. And then when the tide goes out, we'll ride that tide out with the sure knowledge that the tide will come in again. So this is what Shankya teaches us, is that every fulfillment is followed on that level. But once we're living in the depth of the ocean, the fact that the waves are moving on the surface, they still move. We did a little bit of scuba diving, I mean, for a few years, until the fact that we were underwater just got to David and I both too much. The thought of actually being under there without any air got to us, and so we didn't do it much anymore. But we had some pretty interesting experiences. And one of the most 
interesting. I always loved breaking the surface because it's such a world under the water. And then when you come up to the top and there you are again and you can still look down and see the underworld and you can look up and you can see the waves on the surface. It was such a dramatic, I mean, the whole experience was fun anyway, but it was so worth it because this, ever since then, the image of the waves on the surface versus the depths of the sea, there's nothing to compare to putting on a tank and going 100 feet down and really realizing an entire universe exists there that you do not know about on the surface. And once we came up to the surface and it was a rainstorm, and we had no hint of that underneath, that was a very dramatic, like, oh my gosh, look at this. All this rain is falling and the little squall is happening up here. Boom, you go down, nothing. It's exactly what's going on in our lives all the time. We think that this is the only reality until we become still enough to penetrate down into a deeper level. And once you're living from there, even though you're also on the surface, your whole relation to the surface is just different, that's all. I mean, I can't ever look at the ocean now without being aware of the fact that there are these these hidden dimensions. And that's how we begin to feel about our own lives. Well, there's hidden dimensions here. This might be a little challenging, this might be extremely pleasant, but whatever it is, there's hidden dimensions. This is simply, this is not all there is. And that's, that's what Shankya tells us. Or no, Shankya tells us why, but Dante tells us that this is not all there is. Questions or thoughts? Um, Biraj? Um, it, it has dawned on me from time to time that that what you've just been sharing about the, the essence of Shankya is um, the thing that most sets us apart from New Thought teaching uh-huh. and the whole, that, that whole uh, positive yeah. affirmation, uh, uh, everything's going to be just fine, just, just pray harder. That whole temperament just leaves this part out. Yeah. And... Um, and in fact, they resent this part. Yeah. They resent this part if you say that this world is not really fulfilling. And it's, it's, a, it's an absolute divide, but that's, that's the difficulty that I was saying. We come to the practice of yoga when the, the time is now, and we don't prior to that. And um, let me know what, there was a, a point there, just a second. Um, oh, I remember, this was many years ago, like in the late, it was the early 80s, actually. Um, I, I was invited to represent Ananda at a conference about communities. And Peter Caddy was there, the founder of Fintorn. And Fintorn was a real community, and Ananda was a real community, and there were no other real communities there. There were people who, who had bought 20 acres or hoped to buy 20 acres and maybe get a few friends to go. And I we had this slideshow and all this stuff to say about Ananda. Nobody, I couldn't get anybody to listen to me. Nobody cared. And I'm, you know, I'm a fairly interesting speaker. I couldn't get anybody to listen to me. And I finally said to Peter, they're fascinated by Findhorn. Why don't they care about Ananda? Ah, he said, because we promise heaven on earth. And you say that you have to leave earth to get to heaven. He said, nobody's interested. Absolutely right on the, right on the mark. And that's why that is true. Because as someone said, everyone talks about transcending the ego, but you all really mean it. <laughs> and that's why, I mean, statements like Swami's, like, you know, disappointment is inherent in fulfillment. Just think about it. It's true. And people say, no, 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 that's, that's negative thinking. Don't think like that. It's because you think like that. And that's exactly where you go. Is it any wonder we have some PR problems with our message? Yeah, it's true. It, well, we are only the people who, but I, I mean, I really appreciate this. We don't come to the practice of yoga until this is really understood. And you can't try to persuade someone of this. They, they deeply resent it if you try to tell them this. And if they're deeply committed to the idea that with the power of their own affirmation they can bring the reality that they want, this is extremely threatening. In the early years of all of these movements, like in the late 70s and the 80s, this must have been the later 80s when I was here, I used to get what I would call refugees from the New Thought movement. Because these were people who had bought into the idea that if I just do it right, my life is going to come out this certain way. 
if I just follow these rules of manifestation, then the manifestations I desire will come to me. And they would practice it quite sincerely, but unsuccessfully. And then sometimes they'd sneak out to talk to me because they didn't know who else to talk to. But the premise of it would always be, what's wrong with me? Why doesn't it work? And I would be in this awkward position of having to say, it's a, it's a flawed teaching. And no matter how hard you try, you are not going to be able to make that teaching always work. But it works for so-and-so for now. Who know? And who knows what their karma is, but the teaching itself is flawed. It's just not possible for you to egoically choose your destiny and then egoically manifest it. Yes, you may tap into a certain power and be able to do a certain number of things because they'll give me long lists of people who've been successful, and I recognize that. Um, But unless that person transcends it a little bit and goes in a more subtle direction or unless enough time passes, it's just... It can't work because um, it's the wrong inference from experience and there's not sufficiently valid, sufficiently elevated spiritual authority. And I mean, still, I think it does a lot of good for people. And for some people, it brings people into a lot of more dynamic, more positive ways of thinking. I'm not completely condemning it, but when people come to me and say, I keep affirming health, but I still have asthma, I have to say, hmm, there might be something else at work here. When somebody will say, for example, like someone (coughs) specifically brought me the example of how much they were affirming wellness, but nonetheless the persistent uh, physical ailment they had did not go away. I mean, I actually felt it was because they needed to come to uh, a deeper understanding, and God simply wasn't going to allow them to skate over it with a teaching that was fatally flawed. But the worst I saw was that people took it to themselves, that there was something wrong with them. Because, you know, my friend manifested a perfect husband and -and so-and-so has a job and they have a jaguar. And so why don't I? Hmm, they don't know. Karen? Maybe that achievement of uh, the new thought philosophy is a necessary step. Absolutely. So So anyone who's on the path now, our path, I mean, my, my life experience, and I think many others, is that you do get everything that you want or, or you, you have in a recent past life, and then you remember, oh, or you feel. You have that deep feeling, wow, that's not quite it yet. So, but then it's such a deep feeling, then you're ready to embrace the Shankya. And that's why the self-realization movement does not have a lot of people who are aspiring for basic material success. I mean, people talk about it in terms of ethnic diversity, but um, we are ethnically diverse. But it's really a question of if one is still hoping to achieve a certain material success, you're just not interested in a teaching that says, that's not going to make you happy, that's not going to make you happy. Oh, yeah, just try me is sort of the way you'll respond. You have to have had it either in this incarnation or much more likely in other lifetimes. I, I remember saying to Swamiji at one point, speaking of my own life, that I had such an intense desire to, to be happy and not to experience suffering. It wasn't like I was phobic about pain, but it just seemed to me like the only point of this life was to find a solid way to manifest happiness and a solid way to extricate yourself from painful experiences. And I was very yogic in the way that I approach life. I remember as a college freshman, my one year, just being astonished by some of the women in my dorm who absolutely were suffering intensely from wrong attitudes and wrong desires and would even acknowledge them, but just had like virtually no interest in actually shifting their commitment to those attitudes. And it was just so puzzling to me. They would even know that this is making them miserable. And it wasn't just a question of like being helpless in the face of it. It was it not even occurring to them that that was the solution, which, in other words, to become a kshatriya, to work on yourself. So that's why when I finally found an articulation of what I had been perceiving, you know, the necessity to do battle with yourself, that's where happiness comes from. 
it just clicked with me literally just in a matter of minutes. But when I said to Swamiji, sir, I've had these desires, but I said my life has been, you know, a piece of cake. I've never suffered. Nothing bad has ever happened to me. And that's when he looked at me and he just like past lives, Asha. Oh, oh yeah, of course. Been through, been there, done that. Just don't want to go there again. I don't need to go there again because the lesson is solid, really solid in that respect. So now I came to the practice of yoga, you know, in my late teens because it was just where I was. But like everyone else, you know, if I slack off, it's because a big part of me is not highly motivated because I don't really get it. Here does he say it right here. <laughs> yeah, there will be no incentive to practice. <laughs> That's how he puts it. Without some awareness, however slight, of the need for yoga, there will be no incentive to practice it. Isn't that obvious? So we're still getting comfort from all of those things. I'll add my testimony to that briefly by saying um, I'm finding the same thing right now, even though I, I so knew deeply that the world did not provide satisfaction, and it's what brought me to Ananda. Um, when we went, we've had a recent many-year period of wonderful things, good fortune, all kinds of happy things. And I said to David many times, I said, don't forget. Let's not forget when things get hard. Uh, to just be just as happy about it. And things are harder now. And it's harder to be happy about it. Yeah. So I add my testimony to those who have gone before <laughs> you. Just as soon as it sort of fades away, you think, oh, ooh, I wanted that wave to stay high longer. Yeah. And so, so it's fun to be in the class and be reminded of the attitudes that will help us when right. the waves are in their various states of right. up and down, even though you know it. Yeah. It's just different suddenly to, to be out in the ocean exploring the ups and the downs. It, you hear Swamiji say, I hear Swamiji say, I mean, just, I mean, he says it so, like, straightforward and matter-of-factly that it doesn't matter, you know? My body's sick, I'm in a lot of pain, doesn't matter. I mean, I'm in the hospital, doesn't matter. You know, I'm insulted by all these people, doesn't matter. But he says it, it's not an affirmation. I mean, he says it in such a matter-of-fact way. There's no affirmation to it. Sure, you know, if, if everything is going fine, that's fine. If it's not, it's not. And, and you, he doesn't even make a, a big deal about it. There's no need even to make a big deal. It's just such a statement of fact. There's, there is, for him, you know, no pleasure in the wave. And that's what I was saying about there's no incentive to practice. He has, has every incentive to practice because he doesn't enjoy the wave. And a piece of me enjoys certain parts of the wave. There's just no you know, doubt about it. I was sick for this last week and it was not a pleasant experience, but there was a certain pleasure in just you know, lying there with the covers up to my chin and just not having to get out of bed because there was no way to get out of bed and uh, no chance of doing anything responsible or creative. And even our email went down. It was so perfect, <laughs> you know? And even though I was miserable on a very large number of planes, I was miserable. I still was also, there was a part of me that actually just enjoyed because I, I enjoyed being absolutely spared the necessity to put out any energy. <laughs> and Swami does not enjoy that. He just doesn't enjoy it. And he, he even complained recently. He said, the problem now is that he finishes his project so fast that the project that might have sort of entertained him for a couple of months is now done in a week. And he has to find another one. So that's where he is right now. Because he doesn't just want to just sit there. Whereas I would just sit there. I mean, probably not forever, but longer than he would. That's a certainty. But it's because of his consciousness. It's not an affirmation. It's his actual experience of pleasure and pain. And that's what I was trying to say about, we have to just say, you know, I enjoyed not having to get out of bed because it absolutely, res you know, spared me of all responsibility to put out energy. And that's a fact. I'm not, like, terribly proud of it, and I knew that I would the day would come when I would have enough energy that I wouldn't want to, want to feel that way anymore. But I, I'd noticed that about my consciousness, and there it is. Let me just say it out loud. I don't have to pretend to be otherwise. But then I recognize that when I don't have as much incentive to practice yoga, it's because I still imagine it's a pleasurable experience not to put out energy. So this, that's where the battleground is. Let's draw the lines. You have to, I know what I'm saying. You have to draw the battle lines where they actually exist. 
Because if you draw the battle lines where they don't exist and try to fight battles in places where you're not even standing, then uh, you're never going to be successful. You're going to be completely confused the whole time. That's why this first um, sutra is essential. Okay. So Swamiji says here, let me just say that. <clears throat> How many incarnations do we wander? Let me not frighten you by answering that question. <laughs> Indeed, how long each person clings to his delusion is nobody's choice but his own. And I remember, remember that thing where Swamiji says, he said something to Master about having trouble going breathless. Am I remembering this accurately? And Master answered him because you used to talk a lot or something like that. Am I getting that straight? But at any point, there was something, some exchange between Master and Swami. I don't want to say it inaccurately in which Swami said he was having a certain difficulty and Master said, well, that's because you used to have this certain way of being, this delusion that's not, that, and there's a residual from that. And then Master said to Swami, oh, well, but you were happy in that. <laughs> you were happy when you were doing that. You know, and just, just so companionable. And so my phrase for that is always, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. You know, you just doesn't, it doesn't serve anything to try to insist that your experience be different than it is. Just because we're embarrassed or we desire to be something that we're not, it's just the main reason not to do it is a really, really simple one. It doesn't work. And then it takes the initial problem, puts a complex on top of it. And now you have not only your actual state of consciousness, but you have the complex about your state of consciousness. And now you've just condemned yourself to a whole nother cycle. So just observe, pay attention, meditate on it, you know, do what we're doing. Im immerse ourselves in a consciousness that'll, that'll balance it. All right. Any other questions? If not, we'll call it a night. Okay. Class number one, thank you. So we did finish sutra number one. So you can read sutra number two, which is yoga is the neutralization of the vortices of feeling. So you might as well read a couple of them. That's a pretty long one. So just, you know, read a few pages. I'm sure you're going to just read on anyway. And that's what we'll work with.